medically understood. This program is intended for entertainment purposes only. Neither Mark Edwards nor his guest, Hillary Agro, presently use any substances which are illegal within their local jurisdictions, and they do not, under any circumstances, endorse or condone the use of such substances by others where they are not expressly permitted by the relevant legal authorities. Neither the host nor his guest are legal experts, nor are they licensed physicians, and nothing said within this episode should be considered to be legal or medical advice. You should never purchase or consume any substance which is illegal. You should never consume any substance, legal or otherwise, without the expressed consent and approval of a licensed medical professional familiar with your medical history. Failure to heed this advice could result in your arrest, prosecution, imprisonment, health compromise, overdose, permanent disability, or death. The views expressed within this episode are those of the subjects expressing them, and they do not reflect the views of the employers or the academic associations of the speakers. Neither Mark Edwards, Hillary Agro, nor the Ultraviolet podcast are responsible for your decisions. So be safe, be smart, and don't do drugs. Hey there, folks. Mark Edwards here, and you're watching the Ultraviolet podcast. And from that long disclaimer you just sat through, I think you've probably figured out that today's episode is going to be about drugs. Uh, I am joined today by the wonderful Hilary Agro. She is a PhD researcher at the University of British Columbia studying the anthropology of drug use. And in today's episode, we talk about harm reduction, capitalism's influence on drug policy, why all drugs should be decriminalized and legalized, and we spend a lot of time talking about psychedelics. Specifically, we talk about what they do, why they're valuable, why people might want to use them. We talk about bad trips and how to avoid them, set and setting, things like that. While neither Hillary nor myself presently use any illegal substances, nor do we advocate that you do, um, we do discuss our own histories of using these substances. Uh, In particular, I talk about my own struggles with alcoholism and drug addiction and how I was actually helped by psychedelics. I also talk about some very serious mistakes and errors that I made while I was using these substances that could have potentially led to a lot of harm and why I don't recommend people who are outside of the care of a licensed medical professional use these substances. Pretty obvious here, uh, given the subject matter being discussed, but there's a big old content warning on this whole episode. Uh, We talk about drug use, drug abuse, addiction, uh, all of the things that that can lead to, both individually and societally, uh, to include legal prosecution, prison, self-harm, overdose, homelessness, bad trips, the, the list pretty much goes on. So if any of that's going to cause you any amount of psychological distress, if you're a fan of the show at this point, you know the deal. I am not going to be offended if you have to set this one out. I will see you on the next one, and we'll have a good time then. For everybody else, I am going to get right to it and give you Hillary Agro. Hillary Agro, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you are Twitter's resident rave mom, uh, and you are also (laughs) a PhD researcher in anthropology. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us a bit about how you got that title and then how you wound up in the position where you're researching the subject you're researching? Yeah, so uh, I've been studying anthropology for way too long. did my undergrad degree and my uh, master's degree. I um, I actually went to, yeah, when I went to do my master's, I had to decide between uh, studying sort of like biological anthropology, which I've always been really interested in, which is actually a whole other thing because, um, you know, it's it's uh, an area of interest that I still hold, but it's being taken over by like Evo psych yeah. people <laughs> uh, who like to do fascism with it. <laughs> Um, anyways, I, I went away from that and I, I decided to do my master's work on uh, harm reduction in the rave scene in Toronto uh, and the use of psychedelics and MDMA. Mm-hmm. And it was a really great project. You know, I basically 
I, I got paid by the government to party, which was pretty fun. But um, some interesting stuff came out of it because, you know, even just uh, the study of harm reduction, which for people who don't know, it's um, a sort of framework to approach drug use where instead of uh, trying to get people to stop using drugs, you try to get them to, um, you know, try to try to support them in their drug use so that they can use more safely. So that can look like uh, giving people clean needles to use injection drugs with, or it can look like providing water and, um, uh, you know, supplements and information to, to make sort of party drugs more safe. But the paradigm of harm reduction, while it's really, really important as a, a sort of counter to abstinence-only paradigms and just say no and all that kind of stuff that we know doesn't work, particularly a prohibitionist paradigm where you're using state violence against people to, stop, to get them to stop using drugs, it doesn't really go far enough when you start to look at where the harms are coming from. Mm. So that's what I started to look at in my research was, okay, we need to, you know, you go in ostensibly with the idea of, okay, harm reduction is good. How do we get people to use harm reduction techniques? But when you start learning more about where the harm is actually coming from, you start realizing, oh, it's actually more, we need to do more than just provide people with supplies because the harms most of the time aren't actually coming from the drugs themselves. Mm -hmm. They're coming from a lack of access to healthcare. They're coming from police harassment. They're coming from a toxic supply where when people would buy their drugs, they don't know what's in them like, like you do when you buy alcohol or caffeine or tobacco. And so when these harms are coming externally um, from things that have nothing to, well, they have to do with the drugs, but they, it's, it's not a person's drug use decision that's harming them. It's, you know, these societal structures that um, we've built around drugs and that we've failed to build for to build for drug users you start looking at harm differently and that's when i started getting really politicized mm -hmm. um and start, started to look at okay well it's obviously drug prohibition that's the problem but then i took it even wider and said well why do we have drug prohibition and i mean we can talk about that i don't want to go no on too much of a no, tangent that's, um, but um, that's a really good uh intro yeah. um specifically uh just to touch maybe we can just talk about harm reduction and that social system for a little bit because i think that's a really good mm -hmm. segue into a lot of the things we want to talk about um can we let's let's see uh let's talk uh, or i'll let you talk about specifically what harm reduction at an individual level looks like and then we can branch out and talk about those systemic problems where i think you and i both probably share very similar views and i actually through my work as a paramedic, see directly the horrible effects of our social failures to address those issues. Yeah. But uh, maybe start with an individual level for people who are not familiar with just the concept of harm reduction as safety of use. That might be a good place to start. Yeah. So I think the most um, the most sort of infamous examples of harm reduction, which didn't really have to do with my master's research, but my my PhD research is going to be looking at this more is um, you know injection drug use. So injection drug use is less safe than other forms of drug use just because you know it's, uh, it gets into your bloodstream and, and um, it's a, a little bit trickier to use than just taking a pill. But once again, it's not inherently less safe. It's just that um, you need different uh, and more complicated equipment to use your drugs. Um, and so you need things like clean needles so uh, that people don't share needles because sharing needles can People can contract, um, you know, hepatitis, HIV, that kind of thing. And you need to have, um, depending on what you're doing, uh, you know, clean gear, stuff to cook with, um, clean water, vitamin C to, to break down, um, you know, rocky kind of drugs. So uh, it's having these kind of supplies, which a lot of people who are using injection drugs don't have. Um, especially if they're unhoused and they're living on the street, they don't have access to these kind of things. So harm reduction would be, you know, instead of just telling people, well, you should stop using and having them be like, okay, well, that doesn't get me through my next day when I need right. to use. Or, you know, even if they want to stop using, if they have no housing and support, they're not going to be able to do that. So we say, okay, we're going to give you some clean needles. We're going to give you, you know, clean um, water and all of these supplies to do that stuff with. Um, and then, you know, in a, in, in the party, party context, it can, yeah, like I mentioned, it can be things like, um, having a scale to properly measure, you know, if you're splitting a, a 
bag of MDMA with your friends. You need to have a scale so you're properly measuring it and dosing it. Increasingly, test kits mm -hmm. are a really, really important um, form of harm reduction because fentanyl is getting into, it's been in the drug supply for a while, um, but it's getting into basically everything now. Uh, and so having a test kit to see if there's fentanyl in your drugs is really important. Mm -hmm. That's an important form of harm reduction. And uh, that's also um, important as well for... Uh any street drug you want to be testing um, at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. But specifically also with psychedelics too, a lot of people don't think that you need to do that. But uh, pretty much at this point in America, if you're buying blotter acid, you're probably buying an MBOME uh, compound, which is can be very dangerous if you take too much. Um, so you yeah. should be testing all of your psychedelics as well as all of your other uh, more traditional, like what are referred to as street drugs. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, test kits are pretty cheap online. You can get them. They, there's different kinds of, of testing kits and yeah, it's really worth it. And, uh, unfortunately the attitude and this maybe will get us into the systemic problems, but the attitudes towards even implementing some of these harm reduction techniques is pretty hostile. I, uh, back in my video essayist days, uh, did a whole series actually on psychedelic drugs and uh, that eventually got taken down because I wasn't happy with the quality. But uh, in the link, in the description, I included several links to uh, places where you could buy test kits online. And I got a community vi uh, guidelines violation for linking to a place where you can buy something that could <laughs> save your fucking life. So yeah. uh, I'm going to try to find... This is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's, and it's really bad. And I think, you know, I, I increasingly, you know, I'm an academic, I'm hoping to finish my PhD eventually. Um, but the academic job market is god awful and my odds of getting a job, uh, as a professor are very low. So I've increasingly, yeah, I've been, uh, putting my time and energy into social media and it, it's, it's, there's not many topics that are as like heavily, heavily, you know, policed obviously in, on a societal scale but even just online even just talking about things sharing information that could keep people safe mm -hmm. um you know is just platforms don't want to have anything to do with it because it's not they just wash their hands of it and they'd rather ever basically society in general um acts towards drug users as if they just would rather us die than you know yeah because those the, that should be the natural consequences for wanting to alter your consciousness in ways that aren't state yeah. state sanctioned are you uh and making money for certain industries <laughs> um, have you ever encountered something called the three strikes rule as it applies to narcan yeah so let me tell you no. something horrifying <laughs> um uh so i i'm a paramedic and uh, i go to a lot of overdose mm -hmm. calls and uh i have heard this sentiment like verbatim it's basically a meme and first responders police law enforcement uh ems fire uh it's called the three strikes rule and basically okay. the idea is we should give drug addicts three chances uh we uh, we resuscitate you three times and if we come back to you a fourth time we should just let you fucking die um and i have heard that said by a supervisor uh at an ems agency like it is a intensely toxic environment um the people and, and nurses have similar attitudes if i bring in an overdose patient uh, somebody who is you know you know we've resuscitated them or they're they're uh this is increasingly a problem that i encounter with uh, not just narcotics but uh there's meth is a big problem in my area and uh i go to mm -hmm. a lot of people who are you know psychotic because they've been up for three days because they've been smoking meth and uh generally what i do is i have a conversation with those people if they're open to having that conversation i say hey look man <laughs> uh like i've been in a similar situation to where you're at uh i know that you're not having a good time i have medicine that will make you feel better you probably just need a nap is it okay if i give you some meds and usually like they'll be like yeah i feel like shit i want you to give me something and i give them a low dose of a benzo and they take a nap and then they wake up and they feel better. And I bring those people into the hospital and like half the time the nurse is going to come down on them. And why are you using drugs? You know, how'd you get in the situation? And they amp these people up and they wind up tying them to a bed and sedating them because they just, mm. it's fucking horrible. Like the because shame works so well yeah. to get people to do anything ever. Yeah. <laughs> like, so, so 
Um, yeah, that's horrifying. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the dehumanization of, of drug users. Like just, I, I, and I, and I understand that, um, in, in a way, you know, and I have, I have empathy for first responders who are dealing with the worst aspects of drug use all the time, because, in a way, it's almost self-protective mm -hmm. to dehumanize other people yeah. um, in that situation, right? Because, and I, it's the same thing that's going on right now with with um, healthcare practitioners in hospitals that are overrun with anti anti vax mm -hmm. COVID patients. Like to to deal with that level of um, frustration and 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 misery and death and and all of this kind of thing, it's kind of emotionally easier to blame them than to have to constantly be crushed by the by the reality of these people who are dying around you for things that seem like their fault um but the you know the covid stuff is really complicated the vaccine stuff is really complicated but the drug policy is way less complicated than it should be yeah. because it's you know just let people do what they want to their own body without you know having the state try to like crush them give people a safe supply of the drugs that they, they they want to use and you're not going to have any of these overdoses like i'm you tell me how many overdose calls do you get from people who were only use i'm not saying that there's none but just using prescription medication correctly as prescribed so uh correctly as prescribed none um but we actually like even just prescription medication like we don't like physicians are very bad at like having these conversations with people um, increasingly though, that's, that is getting better. Um, it's still not great, but, uh, yeah, it, it's a big problem that I've noticed in minority communities as well. Um, I have noticed that physicians seem to be on balance, less interested in having those long conversations about this is how you properly use your medication with people that seem to be, or have historically been viewed by the system as more disposable. Uh, minority mm -hmm. communities, uh, sex workers, uh, drug addicts, things like that, they don't get that conversation about here's how you properly mm -hmm. take these meds because I think the uh, the assumption is they're going to abuse them anyway. Um, and what winds up happening is you have accidental mm -hmm. overdoses. Um, so, but in turn, to answer your question directly, uh, very, very rarely, I think I've had like one or two where somebody uh, just accidentally took too many drugs. But if you have a conversation with somebody who like, hey, if you take this in this way, it's going to potentially kill you. Very few people will do that. And in terms of drug addicts, mm -hmm. the overwhelming majority of people that I go to that I resuscitate, um, they either uh, had fentanyl in their drug supply, so they weren't capable of properly dosing it, and they didn't have mm -hmm. access to the materials to test it, uh, or they were trying to self-harm intentionally. And that's a whole other set of problems that is not going to be addressed right, yeah. by drug policy issues. Um, so yeah. people generally don't intentionally overdose if only for the fact that it's a waste of drugs. Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. Like nobody, nobody wants that to happen, particularly people who are using, you know, uh, opiates or who don't have a lot of money. Yeah, they, yeah that's, <laughs> um, and you know, how, how far did we make it in here before I'm about to bring up capitalism? Uh, 15 minutes, <laughs> which is actually really good for this show. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new record. Yeah. By all um, means, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean because that's it is it's what it comes down to right um even even things like and you know as an anthropologist this is this is why um for all of its faults as a discipline um i like anthropology as a as an approach to this kind of thing because you can make these different connections um between these sort of discrete problems and, and discrete um experiences like you have your perspective as uh as um oh, paramedic brain fart. paramedic <laughs> yeah you know just a simple uh word that i've known since i was a kid no worries out of my brain um you have your perspective as a paramedic and that's so important um but you know you don't have time to be talking to all of the various um people who have their different right. perspectives and so as an anthropologist what i can do is i can i can spend time with people who are using drugs and say okay what's going on here spend time with paramedics spend time with doctors spend time with well you can't really spend time with politicians but pay attention to what they're saying and and make these connections and um it, it always comes down to capitalism it, it really does 
if, even things like, you know, you, you mentioned that um, doctors often just don't have these conversations with people that can for sure be because, you know, maybe they've tried to have these conversations and it's not successful, so they don't bother. But a lot of it is just because doctors don't have the time. Yeah. A lot of what we need doctors to be doing is educating people. And this, you know, once again, there's a vaccine parallel here. But if that doctor needs to see 15 patients in a day, or if that doctor, sorry, way more than that, patients in a day, um, or if that doctor is incentivized by our capitalist system to try to cram in as many patients in the day as they can, they're not going to they're not going to take the time to to sit there and, and educate people. And we're not putting money into um, you know education. We're not even just um, I don't know about in North Carolina. I'm guessing it's probably not amazing, but luckily in, in Canada, we have like, okay, sex education for teenagers in schools. Uh, yeah. What's it like there? Uh, it's, it's non-existent. Um, oh, I God. basically, so when I was, and now I'm an old boomer fuck, right? I'm 35. Uh, but when I, uh, <laughs> when to the, to the zoomers watching this and the, the younger, uh, I don't know what your sex education is like, but I imagine it hasn't changed if you're from the, uh, if you're from the great home of Dixie, but, uh, basically I got, uh, in America, we have like health class and it's sort of co-located mm. with gym class. And, um, you get, uh, a half a semester of drugs are bad. Um, if you take drugs, you're going to die. Uh, if you have sex, you're going to, uh, get pregnant and die. Um, and any of the natural impulses that you have as a pubescent teenager are fundamentally going to lead to ruin and destruction should you approach them there. And the idea of doing any of these activities, uh, even safely, um, is not only, it's not even downplayed. It's just never even discussed. It's sort of like, um, really? it's sort of like, a, I have to be honest, my brain, <laughs> like it's, it's actually hard for me to accept that because I cannot imagine yeah not giving teenagers like at least like the banana condom demonstration. Like, no, I don't think we even got that. Um, it's sort of like, uh, wow. so are you familiar since we're talking about capitalism, are you familiar with the concept of like capitalist realism? Like where, yes. so like the idea yes. that not only Mark Fisher, everybody yeah, read him. I still haven't <laughs> read the book and I need to, um, but it's actually as, and I'm speaking as somebody who has ADHD and a hard time reading. It's actually a pretty quick read. Even if you read like the first mm -hmm. two thirds of it, okay. you're, you're okay. good. Uh, I will, uh, I, I do better with audiobooks. I'm trying to find like theory on audio. Um, oh, and yeah. uh, that it's like I can absorb it while I'm doing something else that actually works really well yeah, for the good call. dopamine. But uh, mm -hmm. if I have time at work, I try to pierce through it. But I'm, I'm going to read it one day. But the, the bullet points of that, as I understand it, are um, the idea that the system in which you live is so thorough. It, it would be like to imagine an alternative to capitalism would be like to imagine living in a world where uh colors were different right like it's just such mm -hmm. a like what does the number three it would be like living in a world where the number three smells different right it's just such a foreign weird concept that it doesn't even yeah. enter into your brain to consider the possibility let alone forming a uh, cohesive strategy or coherent strategy to implementing that alternative mm -hmm. that's the attitude i think, I think fisher's famous line uh, it's easier to, to imagine the end of the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Yeah. So maybe that wasn't him, but that's a, yeah, yeah, that is the attitude that the American Southern educational system has towards using condoms and using drugs safely. Right. <laughs> it's uh, it's so foreign of a concept that it's not even entertained. Um, right. like it's just, it, it's not even on the table as a thing to be considered, yeah. let alone being bad. Which, in, you know, and this is partly why um, American nationalism uh, is so important to the project of America as a whole, because, and it, once again, it took me actually like a while for this to really sink in. When I lived, I lived in Mexico uh, for a little while, and um, my roommate there was American, and I remember her telling me, oh no, a lot of Americans think that every other country in the world is like a a shithole like it like they genuinely believe that people are just like starving on the streets in every other country in the world and i was like i can't i can't even process that because that's so fundamentally wrong mm -hmm. but at the same time it's like that propaganda is so necessary to the american project because you have to believe that america is number one because if you start looking at oh other ways of doing things maybe some places do things better 
Um, and Canada totally has this too. Canadians are, are totally brainwashed into thinking that our country is the best and it, there is no best country. The whole concept is stupid, but um, you need that because if, yeah, if you start questioning things, then the whole, you know, yeah. the, the rabbit hole goes deep. Um, but anyways, the reason I, I brought up the, um, the sex ed thing um, is, you know, at least, so at least in Canada, we have accepted, um, and in, in some places, we've accepted that we can't teach kids abstinence only sex ed education because it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You know, kids are going to have, teenagers are going to have sex and it, they're going to get pregnant unless they know how to not do that. So um, for, for sexuality, we have at least to some extent accepted that we cannot have an abstinence only model. Nowhere has accepted that yet for drugs. Yeah. And so we're still doing an abstinence only model up here too, everywhere. And so many of these problems that we've talked about, um, even, even without a safe supply, um, and the, the big structural changes that, oh God, I sound like Elizabeth Warren, the big structural changes that we need to see, even without those changes, if we gave people, um, better drug education, and started teaching people about, um, you know, my approach when I speak to students, um, thinking about your relationship to drug use, not just learning about drugs themselves, but but what your personal relationship is to the, con the concept yeah, of consciousness alteration um, and what it is to different drugs. Because, you know, um, I could smoke crack tomorrow and then just be like, oh, that was okay. That was fun. Somebody else might smoke it and be like, this is going to solve all of my problems. Like, yeah. You know, it, 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 and it might be the opposite. I might do ketamine tomorrow and be like, I need to do this all the time. And somebody else might do it and be like, no, that felt bad. Um, so it's never about the drugs themselves so much as what your own relationship to them is and, and what they tend to do for groups of people. Um, so if we can start approaching things that way with, with people, then they would have the information. But once again, you know, it, it, like with capitalist realism, if you start to, if people start to realize, oh, we can't stop people from doing drugs then that just you're cracking up open yeah. this this huge web of like well if we can't stop people then why are they illegal in the first place yeah. like and if they're know. not illegal how do we put you know so many people into the prison industrial complex to make all of our tiny goods that probably like this uh that we don't need yeah. um yeah the uh and and i think this may be a place to discuss some of the um the uh institutional barriers to or institutional problems with like the actual harm of using drugs is not necessarily the drugs themselves like if you talk to enough people who habitually use drugs they develop cultures of use around those drugs like mm -hmm. long-term heroin addicts know how to properly use heroin like as we talked oh, about yeah. like the reason that they overdose is generally because they have bad drugs or because they're trying to hurt themselves for one reason or another mm -hmm. um People who self-medicate with narcotics tend not to do it badly because they've got experience. Yeah, communities of care build up around these things because yeah. they have to because we're we're just alone trying to survive out here. And the uh, the real problems with drug use are if you are caught, like if you're arrested for possession or for low level distribution uh your life is fucking over like you lose your job you lose your kids you lose uh any access to having those things in the future you're basically doomed to living in this parallel society where you are a pariah and that is going to follow you for the rest of your life and you know what's a really good option if you have no other options is that fucking drug that you were dependent on for so long um it basically makes it impossible to get better all of these institutional barriers and it it's hard to look at that and not see it as almost by design either out of a puritanical desire to punish people for their transgressions if we even want to view them as transgressions which is problematic on its own but um either that or because the system necessarily depends on there being this uh ill-defined ephemeral other subclass of people that it can pour all of its uh you know prison industrial needs or like in any other thing that you want mm -hmm. to put on a class of people you can just put on drug users because fuck them yeah right it has it has so many functions um and it's it, you know 
primarily in the, in the U.S., um, it functions as part of this complex, you know, what Michelle Alexander talks about in The New Jim Crow. Um, it functions as a way of um, making it look like racial equality is, you know, being achieved while still um, disenfranchising um, and disrupting Black communities. And because as soon as you, you know, in, in most places, if I'm not mistaken, in the U.S., um, as soon as you've been to federal prison, you lose the right to vote. So it's not if you've I mean, been to federal prison, it's if you've been convicted you've been above convicted, felony. Yeah. So, which that's yeah. a that's a nebulous whole thing. Like base, most people conflate felony and federal prison. Um, a f a, okay. There's a diff I definitely just yeah. did. <laughs> so just for um, the, the clarity, um, we have different administrative levels of crimes. Like, so you can commit a crime that is prosecuted by the state that you live in, or you can commit a crime that's prosecuted by the federal government. And um, then that's a separate issue from the severity of a crime which is either misdemeanor or felony. A misdemeanor is a crime generally, and it varies from state to state, uh, uh, that carries a penalty of somewhere around a year or more in prison or a certain number of fines and then a, or, or less. And then a felony is anything over that. Um, a felony is considered to be a serious crime um, where you can be in prison for like a year or have like tens of thousands of dollars in fines, that sort of thing. Generally, federal crimes are mostly felonies. There are very few federal misdemeanors, but not all felonies are federal crimes. There are, most felons are in the state penitentiary system. So a, okay. a felony is when you are when you get charged with a felony, you lose your right to vote, you lose, uh, and if I'm wrong about this, somebody will correct me in the down there part because they get angry on the YouTubes. Um, and I want to know if I'm wrong, but uh, a felony is when you lose the right to vote, when you lose the right to own a firearm, all that sort of stuff. So I'm sorry, continue. Yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, you know, what, what an easy way, mm -hmm. uh, if, if all of a sudden, okay, it's the 1960s and we got to give black people a few more rights. Uh, what a convenient way of, um, you know, ensuring that we can take those away from as many uh, people as possible by, you know, um, cracking down on drugs in ways that are obviously, you're basically giving cops license to selectively enforce the law, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the law doesn't equally apply to everybody. And um, if you just say, okay, we're going to take this thing that most people do drugs um and we're just going to only just we'll just only go after these people who are doing it but they're still breaking the law mm. so we can use that as an excuse but gee isn't it just such a coincidence that you know five times as many black people are arrested for drugs than white people um and and, it, and it's more than just yeah so they so they lose the right um to vote um which you know while we're while we're kind of doing comparisons between Canada and the US, which I, I always have to be careful because um, Canadian leftists hate how good Canada looks in comparison to the US because Canada is an awful colonial genocidal state that has so many problems. However, um, I think it's, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think the solution to that is um, to ignore the clear differences mm -hmm. Um, in, in between the U.S. and Canada, because things are objectively worse down there. So um, here you can vote in prison. Not only can you vote after you're in prison, you can vote in prison. Oh, that's good. Because we can't, because our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, mm -hmm. um, which is, yeah, it, it, you just can't take it away anybody's vote for any reason. Um, so that's a thing that, that people could do. Um, anyways, so they get their, their vote taken away um, because they've gone to prison. Uh, or because they've been sorry, they've been convicted of a felony. But um, they also what this does is um, removing uh, huge amounts of um, black men from their communities, and also you know uh, Latino men and Indigenous men. Um, you're disrupting those entire communities. Like these are not you know uh, disposable human beings. These are like important people in their community and obviously when you when it gets tied in with things like the black panthers and actual um you know in, in ferguson actual activists um for black rights um it just gives them an excuse to take away very specific people uh who are are important to the to their community and to the fight against the american state but also just on a massive scale you're disrupting mm -hmm. things you're you're 
leaving families without um, income. You're, you know, you're, you're leaving people scrambling. You're also, uh, by implementing the war on drugs, you're turning communities against each other. This is a really interesting one too, because um, by demonizing drugs and by blaming individuals for using drugs, people buy into that. You know, uh, people from even from impoverished communities tend to still blame their friends and neighbors and family members for you know falling into drug use when they have problems or falling into to gang activity. And so then you get people blaming each other, and you're 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 breaking down solidarity mm -hmm. um, in within communities. You're also um, helping to break down solidarity, cross racial racial solidarity of the working class, um, because now you know white people are are just blaming black people for um, X Y Z yeah. things. So um, there's there's so many ways in which the war on drugs functions to prop up capitalism and and prop up the state. That, and I'm so glad that people are starting to understand. You know, by watching the documentary Thirteenth. On Netflix, if anyone hasn't seen it, you really need to watch it. It's one of the best documentaries ever made. Um, you know, people are starting to wake up to the prison industrial complex um, and for-profit prisons, but it's so much more complex than just um, the the prison mm. system. It's it's multifaceted the way the things that that the war on drugs does to people in communities. Yeah, um, I um I read a yeah. paper uh, at one point. I was uh, again for my video essayist days, and this video is no longer available because it sucked. But uh, I, I did a. It sounds like a perfectionism issue. We should talk about that. <laughs> yeah, also we, we don't have time to you know unpack what? all my personal problems. Um, we're we're here to talk about you and. Drugs. I just think the left <laughs> needs to get stuff out there. Yeah. I, obviously, our stuff is going to be imperfect, but like you know what, we yeah. don't have like we're not funded by the Koch brothers, yeah. so just well, get it out. There. Well, also my my added the conclusions that I came to after the research were uh, not the views that I presently hold, um, okay. and I, yeah. I eventually decided that uh it was better to pull that than have something that inadequately reflected my views after i'd done more thinking um right so well, i respect that yeah. yeah um but uh one thing that i a paper that i read and i will find it and put it in the link is uh it evaluated a particular community in new york and it looked at the adult male population and it found that somewhere around an average of 10 to, I think, 15% of the adult male population was at any given point in a state penitentiary for a bit of a year to five years. And that on average, that recycled and that the average, because of the recidivism rate, because we don't have rehabilitative care in this country, which is a whole other fucking can of worms that we don't have time to get into, but uh, um, that you were basically... Uh, putting people in prison for drug use or gang activity. They were in prison for a year uh, or more. They'd be out for a year to three years and then go right back into prison. And what effect do you think recycling uh, 10 to 15 percent of your adult male population has on a community, sending them through prison? And not only uh, something that we didn't talk about uh, with uh, felony, and this is an issue that I personally have experience with, uh, is once you're charged with a felony, uh, you basically can't get a job in America anymore. Mm -hmm. um, my father uh, was actually, uh, did 10 years in, fed in a state prison uh, for a felony. And m my life as a young, poor, working class man uh, was largely due to the fact that my father could not get stable employment for my entire childhood, and we're still dealing mm -hmm. with the effects of that. Now, I think about that, and I think about the fact that I'm privileged in a number of other ways, right? I'm white, I'm cis, heterosexual, straight, all the, th I have all the privileged things. And uh, I'm also fairly capable as an individual. I was able to, despite my own failures uh, and substance abuse issues and every other thing that I got saddled with because of that upbringing, uh, I was still able to develop a career for myself where I can provide for myself, that is not the norm. And if you strip away all the other advantages I had and you amplify that across a community by 10 to 15%, that basically becomes a perfectly encapsulated prescription for annihilating a community's ability to be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. And like you said, um, present itself as not even just a, an antagonist to the system that is doing that, but just even functional. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's basically a perfectly designed method of destroying a community from the ground up in perpetuity. Um, mm -hmm. And that you can then step back and point to it and make essentialist arguments about, well, why don't you just get a job? And so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and the, it's... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just, it's <laughs> fucked up. It's a lot. <laughs> um, which really leads us to the fact that uh, at the end of the day, if the system is not going to be the one to care for us, right, if we can't depend on a system, not only is it not going to be the one to care for us, it's the one that is vilifying us. And um, I say us collectively as like the working class, um, which we can get into the minutia of parsing out the differences between uh, individual communities that have different stakes in that re their uh, their intersectional identities but at the end of the day it's not a uh, they keep us safe it's a we keep us safe and so we have to develop systems where we can fill in the gaps of what this antagonistic system is doing to us and i think a lot of people in the in the drug use community in particular have a lot of experience in doing that yeah i mean i think that there's there's a lot um there's a lot that uh leftists can learn from uh drug user communities. Um, and there's a lot that just people in general actually need to start learning because climate change, like the breakdown of society is like potentially imminent. And even if it's not, you know, with a bang, but a whimper, um, bad things are going to keep happening. Um, and, you know, it's, it's something I've actually increasingly been thinking about um, pivoting my, my public education towards because we kind of, we know what the problems are. We know all of the scary bad stuff that's probably going to happen. Um, but what do we do is where people get stuck. Um, and part of that is because particularly on online communities, particularly on Twitter, it's way easier to, to criticize mm -hmm. than it is to offer solutions because everyone's just going to tear you down. And then we're just stuck thinking, okay, well, everything sucks and all of my solutions, people are saying, uh, are criticizing them too. So I guess I'll just wallow. Um, I disagree with that approach. And I think we need to uh, have more space um, for talking about what, what do we actively do. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, we can look to queer communities and drug user communities for, um, you know, advice on, on mutual aid, because that's really what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Is, um, you know, creating these communities of care and, and mutual aid. And um, for people who aren't familiar with the concept of mutual aid, it's basically creating networks um, of support where when bad things happen, be it, you know, um, there's a, a disruption in the drug supply and people, you know, need to find drugs to, to help them fill those gaps um, or a natural disaster um, like what's happened in Texas and, and the fires and everything. Um, or even just, you know, in sex worker communities, there could be um, somebody who's been particularly violent, you know. Um, there's all sorts of situations in which communities need to be activated to keep each other safe. And queer communities have been doing that for years. Drug user communities have been doing that for years because when you, when you're, and, um, and all, a lot of other communities as well, indigenous communities, when you're abandoned by the state, you have to, like that's mm -hmm. all you, can do is take care of each other and so that there's a lot there's a lot of lessons to learn um there for for how we do that and the nice thing is um when you're when you're participating in mutual aid you're not just helping helping your friends or helping your comrades or, or your community you're actively living mm -hmm. the change that we want to see in the world right like we can't just talk about the end of capitalism and hope we get there someday like we have to enact the type of society um and the type of relationships that we want to have and so it's it's nice it feels good to you know mobilize to help help somebody who is getting kicked out of their house or um you know these these various things that we can do um but the other reason that it's so important um is also because it's just it's going to be necessary mm -hmm. um and it, you know it we're going to need it more and more because bad things are going to keep happening um, but then the other reason it's, it's really important to start thinking through and talking about and reading about and practicing mutual aid is that once again, if we want to look at solutions, okay, here's what I have been presenting, uh, through my, you know, research and listening to people who have been, uh, leftists for much longer than, than I, and have been learning from, from, uh, these campaigns is 
what do we want to do to stop climate change and capitalism? Well, we need unions. We need strong, strong unions who can enact demands. We need um, direct action. Um, we're going to need some things that uh, we can't talk about even on these uh, videos, but, um, you know, direct action. Yeah. Might I uh, just hint at? Yeah. We're going to need those things because that's the only way, um, if you look historically, that's the only way that um, we've ever been able to win against capitalists is through unions and direct action. Um, and so the reason that mutual aid fits into these things is um, strikes can't work without mutual aid. Mm -hmm. So you can't just tell everybody to go on strike and then it's not going to happen without mutual aid networks because people need to pay their rent and feed their kids and protracted strikes. It's like, it's like being in a mediev medieval siege. We have yeah. to have the supplies and the networks, um, you know, built in order to tell people, yeah, you can strike now. We, we've got your back. We're mm. going to support you. It doesn't matter like how long they try to smoke you guys out. We're going to help you. We're going to make sure your kids stay fed during this difficult time. And that's, you know, in, in these battles against um, capital, that's what we're going to need. And so we see mutual aid, uh, you know, we, we need to learn from these communities and, and look at mutual aid, not just as, um, as, you know, an important thing to do because this one person is getting evicted we need to help them that's very important but in the long term we need to know how to do these things yeah to to make things better like not just as a band-aid but like to fight capital and win and get our demands met absolutely um and that's that's something that uh comes up pretty uh regularly on this channel as well um, oh, i'm delighted to hear that uh, actually my last conversation uh with john duncan we got into that territory pretty explicitly oh, yeah. i uh, just started following him on tiktok he's great <laughs> oh, he has a tiktok i didn't even know that that's awesome yeah um, yeah um well I, my last interview well actually at the time that this airs it'll be the interview before my last one uh uh with him we talked about that and uh specifically like building dual power and the climate mm -hmm. collapse and everything that's going to come from that as the system fails and uh mm -hmm. we need to be investing in building mutual aid networks and building dual power because when the system like, there's basically two options that are going to happen one of two things is going to happen in our future um if Either we're going to build these dual power apparatuses and mutual aid networks and infrastructures, and out of that will emerge some sort of, you know, compromise solution between that and bourgeois electoralism, and we'll find ourselves in like this, uh, not ideal, but still sustainable in a short term mm -hmm. way system. New deal, yeah. kind of, yeah. And it'll come out of that, or the whole fucking thing is going to come down on our heads. And if it does, then we'll still have those systems in place to care for us and maintain us in the mm -hmm. absence of the system that we're fighting. Um, and what I have found and what I generally recommend, and it's, uh, uh, comes out of a lot of what you just said is that, um, we don't need to do a whole lot of, uh, trying to radicalize people in terms of their ideology. Um, Number one, because not to poke the bear, but if you look at people like Jimmy Dore and all these other folks who are um, like rad living their way through it, like you just need to march and you don't need to actually organize and do that stuff, right? That's going to fail on its own. And I think people are going to see it fails. Like, I don't need to criticize that. It'll like its failure will be its criticism. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that if I just tell somebody that there's a group of people in their community, right? Odds are, if you're in a major metropolitan area, there's like a food not bombs chapter or there's something, right? You can go to your local LGBTQ center. Um, for instance, like you said, the queer community is uh, any of the activity, like any time I have entered a Minecraft server of note, it has been generally uh, spearheaded by the queer community. Um, so they're, that's a good entry point. Um, uh, food security for like unhoused people, uh, providing Narcan distribution for uh, uh, drug user communities. Like those things are things that I think you can get most normies on board with, right? You can say, hey, let's mm -hmm. go deal with these. And if you just introduce them into these systems that are already there, the act of participating in those things is radicalizing in and of itself. Yes. Uh, yeah. one of the things that, uh, I had a conversation with an IWW, uh, guy, um, 
and I at one point I was trying to unionize a workplace where I don't currently work, so it's not a big deal. But um, <laughs> I uh, I was trying to unionize a workplace um, that uh, that effort unfortunately failed. Um, but I was like, hey man, I work with a lot of really conservative people, and I'm worried that this is going to be a problem. And he said one of the most insightful things I've ever heard, which is, don't worry about their politics, show them that this is in their best interest, and the work will radicalize them for you. The second that you come into direct conflict with capital, capital will show you what it's about. You don't need yeah. to convince them. Let the system mm -hmm. do it for you. And I think that is... I don't need to preach leftism to liberals. I need to get liberals to get invested in their communities and capitalism will radicalize them for me once they're actually doing something of merit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well said. And uh, it's true. And it's why, you know, um, and it's, it's, it's doubly effective because doing that kind of work is actually really good for you mm -hmm. too. You know, if, we, if, we're, if we're thinking about, um, mental health, which obviously all of our mental health is just hanging by a thread because because of all of the aforementioned things plus pandemic. Um, like the, actually the, the worst thing for my mental health during this pandemic has been not being able to get outside and, and, and do things and use my hands. Like I always tell people, I tell my students, um, you know, use your hands. You, when you are trying to figure out how you want to spend your time volunteering, um, if you, you know, there's obviously uh, a place for doing things online. Um, I think the disabled community, um, such a community as you can call it, I know that there's, uh, the concept of community is a little contentious with uh, among disabled people, but um, you know, there, there are things that you can do purely from your computer that are super helpful. But if you are able-bodied, go outside, like join an organization where you can be using your hands to do things, packing up sandwiches, like putting condoms into envelopes with like, you know, just there's so many things that um that need to be done and the physical act of doing things interacting with other people other human beings will get you so much further um than like like you said than than just sort of like watching debate streamers like it's fine or whatever i guess but it's 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 entertainment and it's it, it can be really removed from from the real world and as i go further into social media as a career i always want to make sure that i keep my feet firmly planted outside outside of my home mm -hmm. among other people um because that's where the the learning comes from but it's also because it makes you feel good like staring at your computer is not great for you uh scrolling twitter awful for you um but actually you know i, I haven't been able to to i we moved to toronto i used to live in vancouver i i, I um volunteered with this organization called street saviors which i didn't even really know I didn't really understand the concept of mutual aid back then, but that's what we were doing. We would just get together a couple times a week and bag up sandwiches, like make a bunch of sandwiches, get a whole bunch of harm reduction supplies, walk around the downtown east side of Vancouver and just give people food, give them, give them needles, give them crack pipes, like just make people's day a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And talking to people and doing that, it was like, it was like therapy. It, just being, having, making those connections with other people. And um, and feeling like I'm not alone and understanding that the system is failing us. It's so, so good for you. Um, and so it's it's really important to do that work, not only because it's, you know, getting people outside and doing these things is, is important for mutual aid and building networks and radicalizing people. But it's also just like it's good for you. <laughs> I can't wait to get back to it. I haven't been able to because I've been pregnant and then had a baby um, and had to minimize my contact yeah. with other people during those times for obvious reasons. but. Now that I'm vaccinated, as soon as my toddler is vaccinated, <laughs> I cannot wait to start actually going out. And if anyone's listening to this, if you've never done this kind of work before, just find your local, you know, there's so many different local organizations that you can work with. Um, there's usually like an HIV AIDS organization or um, yeah, homeless outreach. Like a lot of them have volunteer applications on their websites. Ask around anything that you can, can do to help out. It'll be the best part of your week i promise it's not easy but it it will genuinely make your life better and obviously make other people's lives better too yeah absolutely um i couldn't agree more um and i think maybe that is the and, and that's one of the reasons i actually really like your content i think i retweeted something you said and i was like i aspire to this level of home 
of like a wholesome optimism. Uh, <laughs> I, I I genuinely appreciate it because I'm very bad about being very doomer and pessimistic about things. Yeah. But, uh, I can't. I have kids. Yeah. I literally can't. So, <laughs> so I think that's a a really wholesome, optimistic place to end that discussion on drug policy and use. Just get out there, do something, make your community better. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe now we can parlay that into a positive discussion about some of the things yeah. that these chemicals can do for us. Uh, actually, well, it's interesting because this actually is um, reflecting my own research projects. I, I never actually talked about what I'm doing for my PhD project right now and it's a it's a two-pronged project and it's and once again it's just sort of like live the problems Mm. but then try to also live the the joy and the not solutions but the good good sides so because for my phd work i'm doing um uh, anti-drug war activism and safe injection sites but then i also and i had to explain to my committee i had to like get my i had to convince my committee that i could do this um because they're like i don't know that sounds pretty broad and i was like i actually have to the other part of my project is um, psychedelic therapy. Excellent. And I'm doing this double project um, both because sort of like academically and intellectually, it makes sense to look at different at different sides of the war on drugs and different sides of prohibition, because obviously most people who are using psychedelics regularly are living different lives mm-hmm. um, and have a different relationship to state violence than people who use heroin every day. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's important to look at all of them, but it's also because you just, I, I, personally like i am going to have a really hard time dealing with just the bad sides when i'm actually out in the field doing my research so i was like i need something that's more uplifting healing and psychedelics yeah. are great <laughs> they they absolutely are um so let's uh psychedelic therapy is um that is a, a huge area of interest of mine um not only just uh like from a biochemical standpoint, um, I just think the 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 way that the research is progressing in terms of uh, how the chemicals themselves directly act on our brain and all of that stuff is hugely fascinating. But also just the subjective experience of how these chemicals can be healing is truly fascinating and just deeply interesting. And I say that as somebody who, um, while I am no longer a current consumer of those. Uh, I was not born a government employee, and I have immensely benefited from the use of these chemicals. Uh, I would not be the person I am today without having the psychedelic experiences that I am. Yeah, and I, same. I think that that is something that should be more on offer for people who are not, not even just not being helped by the current system, but just, uh, we lost so much time in terms of research Mm -hmm. on these things that could be so helpful for us because of the fucking war on drugs. It's just, it's tragic, but we're getting better. And because of people like you, uh, we are now going out into the world and spearheading this movement for a return to, um, good, uh, well, I'll just let you finish because I'm I'm out of words. I'm, yeah. I'm overblown <laughs> with the happy joy of the psychedelic stuff. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's I have lots to say about that as well. Um, but it's yeah, it's it's great, and you know, it's interesting because, like we were talking about, um, doctors not having enough time to talk to their patients. Once again, it it, it often just comes back to time under capitalism. Like, I I don't subscribe to um, this sort of like psychedelic mysticism mm-hmm. that a lot of psychedelic proponents kind of veer into i don't think that um psychedelics alone are this like magical thing that you cannot achieve any other way but they're just they're just a shortcut like they're a really easy way to achieve what like 10 years of meditation might do or a year of therapy um those uh, meditation therapy you know um those are wonderful things and if people have access to the time and and in the case of therapy money um, that it takes to do them, I think everybody should, um, but not everybody does. And um, psychedelics just are just a shortcut. <laughs> they work um, amazingly well if you're in the right set and setting, of course. Um, and and that's another you know a thing that's really important to talk about when we talk about psychedelics is um, they're not. Uh, MDMA, maybe you can kind of take it anywhere, anytime, and you're like likely to have a pretty good experience, relatively speaking. Um, 
acid mushrooms dmt you cannot do those anytime anywhere uh you could have a horrible horrible experience if you're not in the right context but um it's interesting to think about um what has come out of uh you know my, my ethnographic research among people who use psychedelics uh the things that they cite as important for a good experience are not universal but there's a lot of commonalities um and it comes back to what humans have what have what's been healthy and good for humans since since we were australopithecines <laughs> being outside being in nature being with people that you trust and love um laughter music like these really fundamental parts of who we are psychedelics can um be such a beautiful wonderful experience and enhance and they can they can heal you from uh, lifetimes of, of trauma that that people have accumulated under our capitalist system. Mm -hmm. um, but you have but not in a vacuum. You can't just you know, I mean, you can take them alone in your room and have a pretty good experience if you know what you're doing. But the best experiences come from combining them with getting back to these things that we um, don't often have access to anymore, which is yeah, connection, community, friendship, laughter, music, nature. Yeah, um, I think um, bad trip discourse gets uh, thrown around a lot, and I actually, um, I think that's an an issue of uh, they they happen. I've had plenty, um, but also the most healing experience I've ever had on psychedelics was the most acutely unpleasant experience of my life, um, and. Mm -hmm. To understand that uh, before I tell that story, I think it might be important to like have a conversation about what exactly these drugs do in terms of why they're helpful. And uh, the analogy that I use um, is imagine that you were born in this like old house, right? And you've never left the house. You've spent your whole life in this house. And you know the interior of this house as well as you know the back of your own hand. And then one day you're walking down a hallway and you trip and you are laying on the floor looking up and from your new perspective, you see that this thing that you thought was a wall is actually a door, right? This is something new inside this house you've lived in your whole life that you've never seen before. And so you jump up, you open the door, you walk inside and it's this weird room with like mirrors on the wall. And there's these heavy things that you pick up and put down and you look in the mirror and you realize, oh God, I'm really out of shape. Uh, I guess living in a house my entire life has had a negative effect on like, you know, my, my physical situation. And you start crying because you're depressed because you realize how bad th that situation is. But then you start playing with these heavy things and you realize, oh, this, this is what this room is for, right? Like this is what uh, if I pick these heavy things up, I'll get in better shape. And then you leave the room and you realize that not only did you discover a problem and that moment was acutely unpleasant, but you also discovered that you actually had the tools inside the house to deal with that problem the entire time. You just didn't know they were there. And all it took was a quick, sudden shift in your perspective to look at something in a way that you'd never seen it before. And the house is the inside of our brains and the way we experience our own phenomenal consciousness. And we get so used to the idea that we understand it intimately because it's all we've ever known. But if you take something that forces you to shift your position epistemically from an internal perspective, you will find not only the that you have problems you didn't know you had that you need to confront and deal with, but actually you have, in many ways, already the tools needed to, to address them. And that's kind of a, a very bare bones description of what it's been like for me. And there's also pretty colors and shit, but that's basically uh, what it's like. Yeah. Oh, that's a phenomenal analogy. I love that. Um, yeah, that metaphor. And, and it's actually kind of, funny to think about you know the, the bright colors and the silliness and laughter um because uh you know i used to kind of think that that was incidental mm -hmm. to the healing but um i think it was emmanuel sperios who first who's the founder of dance safe who first kind of introduced me to this concept of um particularly when a person is healing from uh complex ptsd um that 
that we can't underestimate the value of the fun and laughter and color itself because a lot of people have had shitty lives and and rarely feel safe um or just don't have a lot of fun and joy in their life and just experiencing that can be healing in its own right because it reminds you of like oh yeah like you know if you're on lsd and you spend like a full hour laughing until your gut hurts and tears are coming down your face and you just can't laugh anymore it's like it's it's very jarring to be like oh yeah i could feel like this more often if i you know you know and and then you have um well, yeah, not to yeah. not to the, minimize the, the, that stuff. I which no, I no, I, did. for sure. Uh, um, I I just think it's it's interesting to think about the ways that these yeah. things are are inseparable. Mm-hmm. Um, when especially when you start talking about psychedelic capitalism and the people who are trying to make money off of these things yeah. and planning to make money off of these things, and you know, um, sometimes people send me articles that are like, oh, we're trying to figure out how to make a mushroom pill, like, but without the trip. So you get like just the therapeutic effects and none of the hallucinations. And it's like, A, you're really hallucinating in the first place. Like, let's slow down here. But it's, but the idea that you can separate the healing from yeah. the fun parts is actually, it's, it's a, it's a, a product of, of the medicalization yeah. of, um, of, of all this stuff. And so, um, yeah, I'm. I actually remember my first um, experience post pandemic. Not post pandemic. We're still in it, but you know, the first time in a while, and it was just like, oh, like there's there's a certain to a certain expect, extent. There's you learn about things that you can um, heal from, and like you said, you have the tools to heal from those things. Sometimes it's externally imposed, and there's not a lot you can do. But at the same time, uh, you can there are there are ways that you can create space in your life for more joy and laughter and being kind of like kicked into that by a tab of acid and be like oh yeah i haven't laughed like this in a while i need to call this friend more often i need to watch some comedy i you know um yeah. it's I, it's a really cool i think one of the uh the takeaways from a uh a, a huge mushroom trip that i had many years ago was uh i i wound up with a list in my phone of people that i needed to sit down and just tell them how important they were to me in my life and i was like that's mushroom i was like that's the most wholesome shit i've um so is that and you know i think on balance i've probably had uh, my experiences with psychedelics and and i say this as somebody who had a lot of personal issues when i started using them uh mo- probably about 50 50 of my experiences were joyful and the other half were horrific um but they were horrific because i was being confronted with things that i needed to be confronted by and that can be an acutely unpleasant experience um yes i i sorry no no no, continue um I, i well i just recently made um in my sort of attempts to slowly before my mat leave is over um produce some educational materials i I did a little tiktok about like sort of psychedelics 101 and that's often something yeah that you have to warn people about is that the experience can be difficult like if you set yourself up properly it's likely to be fairly pleasant uh for a lot of parts of it um but you have to prepare yourself for it to be difficult and uh you know there there are no you can reframe in your mind the idea of a of of a bad trip like there are no bad trips there's just necessary difficult ones um i mean i've had some some pretty bad trips that weren't like really that you know like recontextualizing in in the long in the long run but um but it was because i didn't i I used them in a place i shouldn't have at a time i shouldn't have or whatever but um even still those you know you can you can take them with the intention of having fun and healing but you know you may end up making a list of people that you need to call more often and you you just mushrooms in particular you always get what you need for mushrooms sometimes i've taken mushrooms and then just been like oh no i need to take a nap like you just get really tired because because the mushrooms are telling you you haven't been respecting your body's need for sleep i remember (laughs) uh the one time i i smoked uh changa um, which for those not familiar with that is, uh, it's basically smokable ayahuasca that lasts like a quarter of the length. Um, it's like DMT with a smokable MAOI inhibitor. Um, so it's like a, 
look it up on on YouTube. It's uh, it, it's a whole thing. But uh, I was sitting on my back porch and uh, I I smoked it. And uh, this is after I had had many DMT experiences, so I wasn't quite sure what I was getting into. I'd never taken like a prolonged bath in that. Uh, and I was sitting on my back porch and I was watching this tree, and the tree like became alive and started talking to me in that very like I'm going to download information into your brain kind of way that DMT uh, does and it basically was like hey man a lot of the problems you have with your father are because of his most human characteristics and you should really appreciate him more for that and by the way you should call him later and I was like fuck <laughs> you're right and I was like uh, I guess and I just wound up calling my dad and having a conversation with him and it's like that's not when you take drugs, you don't expect the drugs to be like, hey, bro, you're kind of fucking up a little bit. Like most people have this idea that drugs are going to be, you know, all laughy and fun and they can be. And those are beautiful experiences, like you said, um, but they can be unpleasant. And um, mm -hmm. and you we have can to go into them expecting that. Yeah. Like you potentially you bought the ticket. You're going to take the ride. And sometimes that ride is going to take you to a place that you might not want to go or be ready to go and you can recontextualize that after the fact right like uh when i when i first got into psychedelics it was when i i quit drinking and uh, i was like a dry drunk as they say in like a aa uh, i quit drinking but i didn't know uh why i drank i didn't address any of those issues and i was taking psychedelics uh, because I was taking any drug i possibly could to distract me from the fact that i wanted to drink and my first time taking mushrooms was I took a, uh, I'll never know how many mushrooms I took, uh, um, but I, it, it was uh, very close to what Terrence McKenna very famously described as a dose that scares you, right? If I were mm -hmm. to go back and take like a handful <laughs> of mushrooms again, I would not take that dose. Um, and I spent the well, next six for those hours listening at home. Don't, don't, don't do, that. do that. Yeah. It's don't do that. Inadvisable. It's not a good situation. Um, I, uh, I spent the next six hours on my floor crying, uh, and I was confronted with every single failure of myself as a human being in like full panoramic photorealistic effects. Uh, all my personal demons became actual demons that did not want to go away. And it was the most horrific experience I've ever had in my life. But afterwards I realized I had shit I needed to work on and I did, and I am a much, much better person, but, right, the caveat there is I should have done that. Number one, I never should have taken that many fucking mushrooms. Number two, uh, <laughs> number two, uh, I should have done that in the presence of, like, a therapist or somebody mm -hmm. who was able to and deal with that. Trip yeah, yeah. Um, I basically broke all the rules, and the fact that I had a on-balance positive experience is not an endorsement for breaking all the rules. It means I got very lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, and that is something that, like I go as a paramedic, right? Like I go to a lot of people who do similar things like that. Like they take a huge, ridiculous amount of drugs, um, or they take them in a setting where they shouldn't, and they have these horrific experiences and it doesn't need to be that way. Right. Um, I think about, here's how I think about this. We have in America, uh, government licensed stores where you can go and buy a prepackaged lethal dose of one of the most addictive and destructive substances known to mankind. But because we have a culture of use surrounding alcohol, very rarely will you have somebody drink an entire fifth of Bacardi 151 in a setting, which if you did might kill you. Um, we don't have that with psychedelics because they're criminalized and they're underground, but if you have the understanding of what you're using and why it can be done safely and you can avoid those horrifically negative experiences and you can extract the real value of them from those experiences in a productive and mm -hmm. wholesome way. And you don't have to be an idiot like I was and do stupid things like I did. It can, it can be positive, but even in those situations, it can still be really unpleasant and you need to understand that that's what you're kind of taking a risk of right yeah but i mean you know as long as people go into it with mm -hmm. the expectation that it might be unpleasant 
um, that can take a lot of the the difficulty yeah. away from it and 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 the fear. Um, you know, mushrooms in particular. Oh, and I would I would kind of compare it to um, because I literally just got one on Saturday. Getting a tattoo, like yes, it's going to be painful, um, but if you know why you're doing it and you take the right precautions and you do it with the right person it's likely to be both painful and really nice and beneficial. And even, and you can even learn to enjoy the pain. Um, you, you know, uh, humans have been manipulating pain for pleasurable and necessary purposes for a very long time. Um, BDSM can be very, very healing for some, mm-hmm. uh, for some people. And it involves a lot of pain, but you just, ha- as long as there's consent and awareness of that, then you're good to go. Um, but, um, yeah, drugs. Drugs are tools. It's they're. It's you know. I don't love making the comparison of psychedelics to guns for a few reasons. Uh, one is that we don't need guns uh, outside of maybe a few areas in like the, the Arctic, um, but we do need psychedelics. Um, but it's the same way that like a gun is incredibly dangerous and in the wrong hands and with the wrong training uh, or with a lack of training it, it's it can be horribly horribly dangerous but it doesn't mean that a gun is inherently just on its own like it, it's just it's just an object it's a tool mm-hmm. and so are drugs um you just need to have the right information and context and materials to to make it work but i do want to note that mushrooms in particular i like that we're talking about difficult experiences on mushrooms because uh one of my sort of like things that i get i i you know my soapbox is that i like to be on is i there's this common idea among people and part of it is because of the naturalistic fallacy of people thinking that because something is natural then it's safer which is a fallacy um but there's this idea among people that um like it goes like weed and then you do mushrooms and then like acid is a step up for mm-hmm. mushrooms and in my experience and the experience of most of the people that i know and have spoken with for my research it's very much the opposite <laughs> Acid is a lot easier to handle than mushrooms. It lasts longer, which can, if you have a negative experience, then it's more time, then that can be difficult. But mushrooms are pro level shit. Like, you cannot hide from your problems on mushrooms. You can kind of hide from your problems on acid, uh, but they'll find you on mushrooms. Mushrooms will, will dig into, like, there was actually a couple of years where I stopped using mushrooms because I knew what was going to happen mm-hmm. when I took them. I knew what it was going to bring up and I was not, I didn't want to deal with that. I just didn't, I didn't want to process that. And I just was like, I'm going to have to just use other things and very specifically not mushrooms because I, I want to be in a place where I'm mm-hmm. head on ready to, ready to take it. Was it uh, so I just Terrence think that's McKenna it. said mushrooms speak English. Like they will walk <laughs> into your head, put their feet up, and tell you exactly what the fuck you need to hear, whether you need whether you want to or not. Yep. Yeah. Very much. And I don't want to, you know, scare people away right. from them um, because they're wonderful and, mm-hmm. and, and incredible. And also the other thing is that um I always tell people if you're going to start experimenting with psychedelics, don't Take a big handful at once, as we've discussed, but like you don't even need to take a full gram. Right. Um, So this is another, this actually gets back to um, uh, wanting to change drug education to not be abstinence only and teaching people to, you have to learn how to use drugs, right? Even Mm -hmm. with alcohol, um, you can either learn with your parents at the dinner table where they let you try a glass of wine and you see how you feel like they do in France. Or you can learn when you're a first year university student getting like plastered in your dorm room with your friends for the first time. And we know which which outcome is going to be better. You have to be everybody. We have to be taught how to use drugs. And um, the idea of like teaching people to use drugs like, is a sounds very controversial. But if you think about it, we, we do that with 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 sugar and coffee and tea and alcohol. Um, and we need to do it with with other drugs too um Mm -hmm. and so if people are going to be and people by necessity kind of have to like self-teach how to use psychedelics um but just just start low just start with a low dose if people want to have their big breakthrough experience right away but you have to learn how to use the substance you have to know how you feel on it so take a little bit the first time notice your bodily sensations notice what's going on as you're feeling then a few weeks later try a little bit more Mm -hmm. weeks later try a little bit more because that will also 
make you much more likely to have a positive experience is because you when you finally take a dose that like really you know gets gets the blood pump and starts to get things going you won't be knocked into an anxiety spiral by not understanding why the walls are breathing yeah like you'll be like okay i've seen this before yeah i can handle that now let's let's think about my mom like <laughs> i uh um mindfulness training if you have no if you have experience mm. with uh meditation and like learning to pay attention to your own subjective conscious experience um i would recommend now i mean there are people for whom mindfulness training will cause anxiety um and be unpleasant um i i would actually i'm going to go back and restate this um I think mindfulness training is a very good thing to do before you start taking psychedelics. Mm -hmm. And if mindfulness training causes you prolonged extensive anxiety, you might want to reconsider taking psychedelics because it's going to do, I just now thought about this um, because there yeah. it's like a good litmus test for if uh, that introspective lens being turned like, on itself like that recursive conscious experience there's a taste of that in what you get when you meditate for like 20 30 minutes uh and if that hurts you you probably shouldn't take mushrooms or acid because mm -hmm. basically or at least not yet yeah, at least not yeah. yet like until you get over that so that's actually yeah, I would... that's really interesting because i've been in group therapy situations where you know we we all do a meditation or whatever and yeah sometimes a person will come out of it and be like no that that i didn't like that at all that was horrible i yeah and i'm just kind of like oh that's yeah interesting um i don't relate to that but i'm i'm curious about it but that's a really interesting yeah uh yeah yeah, no, way I, of putting that for, I, for psychedelic i just thought about that because i usually always recommend people if I obviously don't recommend people take drugs, but uh, if they're no, going, don't do anything if, illegal ever, yeah, friends. <laughs> if you're going to, uh, regardless of what I say, uh, I would recommend harm reduction. And part of that harm reduction for psychedelics, I would say you should probably have some experience with learning how to manage your conscious experience when it becomes recursive. And the easiest way to do that is through meditation training. And if that causes mm -hmm. you problems, you need to work with the work through probably need to work through mm -hmm. those problems before you take something that's going to make it impossible to stop doing that for six mm -hmm. hours. Uh, I, or at least, you know, figure out what, what can help mm -hmm. with that. Because that's once again, where we can sort of try to break free from um, the individualist mm -hmm. uh, approach to everything that we are trained to have under capitalism and be like, is there a friend that could be around me mm -hmm. that I think would keep me safe here that we could share this experience together or they could be sober or, 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 or whatever. Um, where with that person, I would feel that they would be able to help me with this. You know, like you have to be able to ask for help. You have to have somebody that could help you, um, which are both, uh, easier said than done. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, the importance of a good, I feel like if, if, if everybody who's listening to this took a second to just think of who in their life, Mm -hmm. they would want to have around when they're at their when you're at your absolute most vulnerable saying potentially absolute nonsense you know looking like an idiot and if you have a person in your life that that would not judge you for that that's a special person keep them around but you know consider consider them for a trip sitter <laughs> yeah um, because uh yeah that's that's actually uh i do want to talk about trip sitters and like um i guess we can go through the whole set setting trip sitter thing explicitly because for people who are not familiar with that. Um, but I, I want to go back and touch on something you said uh, about we need to teach people how to use drugs. Um, I have a joke that I tell uh, all of my coworkers uh, on when I'm working on an ambulance and we're about to go to a uh, marijuana overdose call. Oh my god! I think I've heard this before from another paramedic. Uh, paramedic, I want to hear the it. The joke, and it's not a joke. I'm actually deadly serious about this. We need to take uh, ten or twenty thousand dollars of our operating budget and do a PSA teaching college kids how to smoke weed and take edibles, because the number of people that I go to who take five hits off a dab rig their first time smoking pot and think they're dying is just it's bananas like we we 
we need to teach kids how to use pot because I, yeah. I know if you're out there, if you're listening to me, right, we're a bunch of old boomer fucks. I don't know how old Hillary is, but you know, like, millennial. Okay. come on, you're a millennial yeah. too. You're not a boomer. You're 35. Uh, to, I'm a, I'm a boomer to the zoomers. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, if you're listening to this, take a tiny hit off the dab rig. The first don't take drugs, right? Never take drugs. But uh, if you're going to take drugs, take a tiny hit. It's off legal the dab. in Canada. Okay. So. Yeah. If you're in Canada, do not take a full hit off of a vape pen or a dab rig your first time or your first couple times. If you are taking like five hits off of a fucking THC dab rig, you might as well just take mushrooms. Like, <laughs> like the, just don't do Cannabis it. Cannabis is such, it's so much of a stronger drug than people give it credit yeah. for. And I understand that I feel like that there's been this um, this sort of like backlash to the demonization of cannabis where people counter that by saying it's not a big deal, it's a plant, it's a drug, it's fine, whatever. Um, and no, it's not going to, you know, make you go insane and jump off a building or run away with a jazz musician. Uh, I mean, if it does, that's that's just cool and awesome and good. Yeah, no. But um <laughs> It, but you know just because like the lies that we've been told about weed are not true doesn't mean that it's like a not a, a not a big deal yeah. drug it's a very strong drug it's actually one of the few drugs i cannot do like it's too strong for me and mm -hmm. i have done all of them uh, so it's like yeah we, we we do actually need to teach people about dosing but it's also quite irresponsible of dispensaries like this this isn't like booze like you can't just give it away to people without giving them any education on it it's i had a friend of mine um who's a paramedic in victoria bc in canada um he actually told me that after legalization they started getting way more calls because of cannabis mm -hmm. part of that could be because people weren't afraid anymore of um of calling for help because they're not afraid of getting arrested which we can't underestimate mm -hmm. um and that's a good thing but um, a lot of it is just because they're taking edibles and the store is just like, yeah, here you go. And they don't realize that they're supposed to take like a nibble off of this fucking mm -hmm. cookie and everything's way too strong. And yeah, there needs to be. Yeah. Uh, the only better approaches to that. The only funny thing Joe Rogan has ever said is that a gummy bear should not be able to steal your fucking soul. Uh, <laughs> like it's just like t just eat a leg like eat eat the leg. Don't uh, we're yeah. actually getting that same effect here because of Delta eight, which is legal. Um, mm. and, uh, we're, we're getting, uh, just, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you got to, I need to grab my baby. Yeah, absolutely. Just pause sure. this. I'm going right to use the restroom real quick. So for listeners and viewers, we had to take a quick break so that rave mom could <laughs> grab a uh, rave baby who is absolutely mm. adorable. And we, mm. we love, we love the kid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Everybody say hi to kiddo. Kiddo, how are you doing? Should we legalize drugs? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you can't have any until you're an adult. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So where did uh, where did we leave off? Um, um, well, actually, one thing I wanted to mm -hmm. uh, just mention is uh, the, the paramedic joke. It was different from the one that I had heard from a paramedic friend. But um, so, yeah, the, the, the joke that a, a paramedic that I interviewed during my master's research told me was um you know and this is despite all we've been saying about how uh strong cannabis is relative to other drugs uh you know it um basically she would say that when they had a heroin overdose it would be like okay we got to get the narcan you got to get this and that like stat take it really seriously and when they would have a cannabis overdose it was like okay we need a bag of doritos and a bottle of coca-cola stat yeah <laughs> uh you know because there's you just need to keep the person calm and then send them on their way. Like as, as real and, and dangerous as anxiety can be. Um, yeah. You're not, you're not going to die from weed. I, I spend a lot of my time, uh, coaching people on how to do yoga breathing. Uh, and that that's useful for anxiety attacks as well. Um, I, I do know I've been to a couple of people who, uh, so most of the time, if I get called to somebody who's been using psychedelics, it is uh, because they have done what we have said not to do, which is to take a large, large dose in a bad sitting setting. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are at the point where they are actually a danger to themselves or other people. And unfortunately, they just they, they have to be sedated for their own safety, um, which I wish that was like we can talk about 
the state power and all that, and it's a whole can of worms, but that's just the situation that it is. Um, but I have been to uh, uh, a number of people who just like narcs called. <laughs> uh, they're like, oh, this person's on acid. And uh, most of the time what I do with those people is uh, I just, I'm like, what kind of music do you like? And I just put on their favorite kind of music and I turn the lights down in the back of the truck and I'm like, all right, man, let's go. And uh, I go to the hospital. And I'm like, hey, uh, talk to the nurse. I'm like, hey, do you have like coloring books and stuff for kids that you keep under the under the thing? And most of the time they do. <laughs> and I just get I'm just like, give that dude a color, uh, like some coloring books. And that's I've done that twice. And because uh, I was like, listen, that dude's going to try to get out of his be- his room because he's tripping balls. Uh, just give him something to do that's fun. And uh, you give that dude a coloring book and he's fine. <laughs> and, and, you know, and and once again, this this is the kind of thing that um if we didn't stigmatize drugs so much, medical professionals should have this kind of knowledge. You know, I ran the um, Women's Safer Space at Bamboo Base Festival in Costa Rica a few years ago nice. as part of their harm reduction team. And I was also one of the only people on the harm reduction team who spoke Spanish. Uh, and so occasionally I would get called to the, uh, to, the, to the medical tent to help translate because all of the medical staff uh, only spoke Spanish. And... Um, I was called into one because there was a girl who was freaking out. Uh, she had she had a cut on her leg, but she was just losing her mind. Like I think she was going to die. She was on acid and also cocaine, which you know, not um, not a good combination. Yeah, don't combine stimulants and psychedelics because stimulants can trick your body into thinking that you have anxiety because it raises your heart rate, uh, and then that plus the psychedelic means you're going to spiral over something like getting a cut on your leg. But the paramedics had no idea what to do because they, they couldn't understand her. They didn't know why she was freaking out so much over this cut. Um, but they also just didn't have the, the knowledge once I sort of like translated and was like, okay, she's on acid and LSD. And they were like, what the fuck? She's on a bunch of drugs. Like, I don't know what the hell to do. Um, and But I did because I had this experience. So I was able to calm her down and bring her to the, like, you know, give her a band aid, bring her to the harm reduction tent. She didn't need physical attention. She needed like psychological mm-hmm. attention. But um, it was, you know, a, a good example of um, when medical professionals just don't have the knowledge about um, drugs and even, even, you know, doctors and nurses, you might have like sort of a lot of pharmacological knowledge and, and knowledge of general um, medicine and stuff. But the, but the particular ways that um, psychedelics manifest in terms of health problems or um, the ways that... that um, yeah what 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 happens with when you're on certain drugs so much of it people go into it into it thinking that they know more about drugs than they do Mm -hmm. people everybody thinks that they know about drugs but most people's knowledge just generally from what you pick up from culture is just not accurate like you as a as a fellow you know um person fellow yeah or or you as a fellow fellow yeah um yeah i i I have ambiguous relationship to the concept of or the term drug user because everybody's a drug user if you use coffee you're a drug user but anyway um you will understand this and anybody else who has done psychedelics or mdma um or even smoked weed regularly will understand this when you watch a movie and they portray a drug use experience, you can immediately tell whether or not the director has used drugs or not. Midsummer. Because, yeah, it's, I haven't actually seen that one yet, it's, but. It, the movie is kind of yeah. like meh, but in terms of like psychedelic use, it's probably the best description of what mushrooms do to you that okay, I've ever seen. interesting. Yeah, I saw Hereditary and I went into it thinking that it was a drama. I didn't know it was a thriller. And then the thing happened and I. Hereditary, uh, just PSA for anybody watching this. Hereditary is an excellent film. Um, you don't have to worry about the kid crying because I'll edit that out in post. Um, I'm going to actually grab yeah, our feeder while go we're ahead. talking. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Hello, kid. Hey. Yep. <laughs> the feeder, this is me normalizing breastfeeding in the workplace. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, uh, PSA for people who uh, have not seen Hereditary. I. Uh, I watched that and it's an excellent film. Uh, but that is one of the only movies that I've ever seen where I had like a legit, uh, post traumatic. I like had a full on panic attack, uh, at the scene when the mother is crying 
uh, after the thing that happens. I've heard that sound in real life too many times. And uh, I, if I had been in a theater when I saw it, I would have gotten up and walked out. Um, instead, I went up and took a Xanax and I finished the movie. And it was, I was glad I did. It was a good movie. But just it's a heavy experience, that film. It's, yeah, it's a lot. Um, yeah, there's, I, I tend to stay away from most dramas, horrors, thrillers, mm -hmm. uh, basically for that reason, because the, the stuff that I do, the work that I do is like not theoretical. Mm -hmm. It's like genuine suffering. And I, I just don't really, really want to deal with yeah. that on my free time. But anyways, so the, the point being, um, yeah, you can tell if a director has actually used drugs or not as soon as you watch the scene. And we kind of like let let artists, uh, you know, directors and stuff get away with these terribly reductive, stereotypical depictions of drug use. And then it becomes it just ricochets back and forth in our culture. And people assume that they know what drugs do to a person or they just generalize all drugs, you mm -hmm. know, and and every drug is different and every, every drug is unique. Um, so we need, we need people to be able to have the knowledge, um, if they're going to, you know, give proper medical care to people. Um, but then you get back into the idea that, well, nobody really wants to give drug users medical care because we don't deserve it. I think, uh, I, because we're not people. <laughs> I used to do this and it's come in handy one time and I probably need to start doing this again. Um, is, and this is a good tip for any trip sitters out there. And I think we can finish up the episode by talking about trip sitters and what's good for that and all that stuff. Uh, but just uh, this one anecdote is uh, one bad trip that I went to professionally for somebody who was having a bad trip, like they were just having a rough time. And uh, I had a bunch of paramedics around me, uh, like my supervisors and stuff who were like wanting to medicate this dude. And I was like, look, he took a tab of acid. He's just having a rough time. Uh, so I put him in the back of my truck and I turned the lights down and I put on some good music. And then I like, I was like, here, chew up this handful of Altoids. Uh, <laughs> and like that gave him like enough, like mega sensory, like one single thing to focus on that within 10 minutes, he was completely fine um and that's like a good yeah. uh like a, a lot of indigenous folks with like ayahuasca retreats will tell people to chew on peppercorns or put lemons in their mouths and just mm -hmm. a single sensory thing to focus on will take your mind off of a lot of other stuff and bring you kind of back to center um yeah it actually it actually works for for anxiety yeah. and and like ptsd flashbacks mm -hmm. as well i remember um when i was pregnant and i couldn't i couldn't use any drugs obviously and um I was dealing with a lot of anxiety and uh, I was kind of like having like an anxiety episode in a situation where I couldn't do anything about it, but I was at the dinner table and I remember just being like, I'm trying to like figure what I can do to distract my body from this. And I was like, mm, hot sauce. And I just dumped so much hot salsa onto my plate and was just like, oh, like just setting my mouth on fire. And it totally worked. Um, but the distraction stuff is also interesting because um, now that I'm a parent, mm -hmm. uh, I'm. It's amazing how many uh, parallels there are between trip sitting recommendations. You know, if you go through like training for like psychedelic uh, support to be a psychedelic support person, uh, and you read a book about dealing with toddler emotional reg regulation, it's like all the same stuff. Okay. <laughs> and it's it, it's funny to to see those parallels because you know there's this sort of like common wisdom in, in the psychedelic community that that psychedelics bring you back to childhood not um in the same way as you know like mdma could uh if you're actually dealing with childhood experiences and working through trauma but it just it puts you in a childlike state and i think that there's actually this actually lines up with some of the um uh like you know bio biochemical um neurological research that's being done on psychedelics and the way that it makes connections physically in your brain between parts of your, of your brain that aren't used to being connected but um kids are just wide open every kids are just basically on a 10 strip of acid all day every day <laughs> like they're just it, everything is new to them and that can be really really good but it makes you very very vulnerable yeah um but it's it's amazing the the parallels it is and i i've, I've said that before uh anytime yeah. i come into contact hey baby I, you agree yeah I, anytime i come into contact with kids i usually make the joke i was like kids are just like adults on acid um it's like oh my god did you know i have feet <laughs> um so 
exactly. Uh, well, yeah. you know, and sometimes parents don't like that uh, joke, but you know, those are I, I can tell instantly who's That's cool and who's not. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's very it does reduce you to a. Uh, it's to true though. A childlike you know, state. Leaves are really cool. They yeah. just look at the lines, not look at the clouds, like. It's like uh, and it's uh yeah, but it's it's beautiful because kids kids are able to appreciate um the world in ways that we kind of forget about as an adult it's nice to go back to that state with, and you know if if we're gonna once again be trying to survive on a on a dying planet that's well not so much dying as like being actively murdered by capitalists we have to be able to find those little joys too yeah and i i think um actually the the whole set setting trip sitter thing actually really does come into sharp focus for why you need those things if you just imagine that when you take mushrooms or acid or dmt or anything like that you're effectively reducing yourself to a childlike state and what would you want to take into an experience where you're going to be turned back into yourself at two or three years old um, mm -hmm. so maybe we can uh kind of end or wrap this up by just going down the list of people who are thinking about going into these experiences which obviously you should never do uh as long as it's illegal don't don't do drugs kids um but if you're going to despite our advice uh what what should you do to reduce your harm in terms of set setting trip sitter all that stuff yeah well if somebody wants to hear uh a little bit more about that you can check out my TikTok. I'm just Hillary Agro on TikTok because I haven't been creative enough to think of like a cool name uh, for my stuff. But um, I did actually create a little video recently. It's about three minutes long, but it, it kind of goes through all the the psychedelics 101 uh, recommendations for set setting. Um, uh, what is it? Set setting. Uh, I forgot the other S N, but and and also dosage. Source. So basically, source. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yeah, basically set setting source and dosage. You want set just means mindset, the the mindset that you go into the experience with, you have to uh accept that it could be a difficult experience, but that the difficulties are are part of the experience and and will always give you what you need. Like, you know, you're never going to do mushrooms and the mushrooms are going to tell you you really need to dye your hair green and then you come out of it and you're like, "What the fuck?" Like, no, they're going to tell you important stuff that that you need to hear. Um but you need to be in a position where you could potentially, where you're willing to hear that. So if you're having a really bad day and you're partic or you're particularly going through a depressive episode or something like that, you're not in the right mindset to do them. Uh, setting is just, that's, setting is the fun part. Like preparing for a psychedelic experience, even just the preparation alone, if you are preparing for a psychedelic experience, you're most of the way there. Because a lot of the, of the time when people have a negative psychedelic experience, it's because they did it with no planning um, and just kind of it was offered to them. And so they sh say, sure, why not? That can go really well for people, but it could also go badly. So you just want to make sure that you're prepared with um, the right music, the right snacks, the right people around. Um, source is you have to know where you're getting your drugs from. You have to make sure it's tested. And uh, dosage is make sure you know the dosage that you're taking um, and uh, that you, yeah, start low, go slow, like we discussed. So, yeah. But for in, and in terms of trip sitter, it, it's interesting because I feel like um, actively getting a trip sitter and like doing that and booking that as a, as a whole day where somebody's just taking care of you while you do psychedelics, it's really advisable. Mm -hmm. Um, and I strongly suggest that people do that. If you're going to be doing a solo trip, find somebody who, uh, is non-judgmental, who particularly, you know, yeah. Like if you were a little kid and you pooped your pants, who do you want to have around? Do you want to have around somebody who's going to shame you for doing that? Or do you want to have somebody say, well, that was silly. Get in the shower. <laughs> you know, like you, you want to have somebody really non-judgmental. Um, and I do also want to reassure people, um, when we talk about regressing to a childlike state. Um, if you have severe PTSD or complex PTSD, do be really careful about going into these experiences. Um, but you're not necessarily going to like regress back into your childhood and relive a horrible traumatizing experience. That's not really how these things work. Um, you're just, it's, it's almost like you get to re redo your childhood for a couple hours 
and do it right with people that you trust and that love you unconditionally um, if you can set it up that way. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. You should uh, you should have an uncomplicated relationship with this person, right. uh, yes. ideally. Like, you don't want to have as your trip sitter somebody whom the drugs may tell you actually you have a series of very deep-seated issues with this person that you need to address right now. Um, yeah, if you're is... going to do that, use MDMA with the person. Yes. Yeah. MDMA in a, in like a therapeutic setting mm -hmm. with somebody else, amazing, perfect. We didn't really get time to talk about that today, but MDMA in terms of interpersonal therapy in the moment, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, that is, uh, and that's a whole other uh, thing that we could, uh, maybe we'll have you back on to discuss that specifically. And like when, uh, I'm sure there's way more we could discuss, uh, uh, time permitting. Yeah. I'm, I'm having fun. <laughs> Clearly we've been talking for a while, yeah. so um, we can just do a part two. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll, um, so let me, I'll give you this opportunity to just tell everybody where they can find you. Um, I know you have, uh, you're a great follow on Twitter. Uh, you've got your TikTok. Is there anywhere else that, uh, people can find uh, you? That's mostly where I am right now. I kind of live on Twitter. I just <laughs> have, uh, developed a bit of a, um, uh, being a sort of well-known leftist account on Twitter over the last few years of like tweeting while breastfeeding on the couch. <laughs> but um, usually, usually I'm, I'm busy uh, like teaching classes mm. and stuff, uh, but I'm increasingly getting away from that and into social media. So yeah, I, I just recently like a week ago started a TikTok account. I'm having fun with that. Um, stay tuned. I have some plans for YouTube, but uh, much like you, I'm a perfectionist and I'm, I want to release higher quality videos eventually when I have time. So yeah. yeah, but if you want to check out my um, my master's research is available for free online. The thesis that I wrote, you can just search for Hillary Agro thesis, and I'm pretty sure it comes up on there. And I also have a blog that um, I haven't updated in a while, but um, it's going to turn into a research blog again when I'm starting my PhD research. Um, so yeah, you can just kind of Google me. I'm, I float around the internet. I'm there. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So, well, um, yeah. yeah, everybody should, uh, you, you're definitely a really good follow on Twitter and, uh, I've been reposting your TikToks. I think one of them was like, we should just replace eighth grade health class with the set setting thing that you did. Um, which is, I think what <laughs> oh, yeah. prompted me to want to talk to you in the first place. So definitely check, yeah. check Hillary out on Twitter and, uh, TikTok if you're, if you have a TikTok. Um, I, I do, and I spend way too much time on it, but, uh, we should, inject a uh, good quality content into our mindless scrolling when we can and you're definitely a source for that um all right hillary Agro, Excellent. thank you so much for joining me i appreciate your time thanks so much this is great hey everybody mark edwards here again I just wanted to thank you so much for watching, uh, and I wanted to say a special thank you to the patrons of the show whose names will be appearing somewhere in the space around or above me. I'm not sure yet. Um, I've moved all of this thank you stuff and social media shout outs to the end here to help with engagement. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for sticking th with me through this rebranding process, which should be complete now. Uh, everywhere that you previously followed me on social media should now be under the new name at Ultraviolet Pod. Uh, Twitch is UV Pod. And the website, which is now live, is ultravioletpod.com. The new email is ultraviolet at gmail.com. So um, my cat's making a lot of noise eating food. I hope you can't hear that, but if not, whatever. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed this content and you like what I do, then please upvote it here on YouTube. Uh, leave a comment. Uh, that really helps me with the algorithm. Share it with your friends on social media. If you're listening to this via a podcasting app, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get it, uh, leave a five-star review. Leave a comment. All of that stuff really, really helps me out, and I really appreciate it. If you want to give me some money for my trouble, there are links in the down there part to various places that you can do that for a one-time payment. I have PayPal, I have coffee, I have a Venmo. If you want to support the show uh, directly, you can become a patron. I'm currently running a $200 goal that will make this show self-sufficient. 
and I can start getting patrons early access to the video as well as the early access audio that you all presently get now. Uh, once again, thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it, and I will see you on the next one.